Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show the great Mr. Robert Moriarty. Bob is one of the world's most popular financial commentators. He founded the websites of 321gold.com and 321energy.com to cover our economic situation in an extensive way. He is famous for calling economic moves before anyone else sees them coming. Bob's perspectives are powerful because he has been a major player in both the gold and energy sectors for decades. He's a best-selling author, he's an expert in the junior mining sector, and he holds many international records in the field of aviation. He is notorious for flying a fighter jet through the lower pillars of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. He's one of our favorite no, no, guests. No, 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 no. It was not a fighter. It was a bonanza. And it, I, I did it on, uh, I did it with Photoshop. So anybody saying that I flew through the Eiffel Tower, they just made that up. That's a terrible thing to say. But it was not a fighter. It was a bonanza. Any, yeah, wait a minute. You did it through Photoshop. Yeah. I'm not going to admit doing something like flying under the Eiffel Tower. I live in France, for crying out loud. Okay. Now, wait. Did you actually do this, or did you Photoshop it? Did, did, did I? Yeah. Moi? Yeah. No! I know you did this. I know you, because I know you. This is exactly something that you would do. But why are you not admitting it? I, I'm pulling your leg, Michelle. Oh, okay. So, somebody, somebody called me years ago and said, look, I don't believe you did it. I think it was fake. I think it was done on Photoshop and, and you didn't really do it. Nobody would do that. And I said, well, you, you can believe that. And he called me back a year or two later and said, you know, I, I was in Paris and I took the, the cruise down, down the Seine River and we were passing by the Eiffel Tower, and the the guy said, "You know, back in 1984, a former Marine fighter pilot flew a bonanza through the legs of the Eiffel Tower." So now he believes. Now you, you tell. Now are you telling us that you did this, or you photoshopped it? You did this, right? Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Ready? Just coming over the river. Okie doke. Uh, okay, I'm gonna tell you, can I tell you a really embarrassing story? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, our okay. whole intro is trying to understand what the truth is with Bob Moriarty. Okay. I went to Cyprus, and they had a young 29-year-old female geologist, and she said, look, I want to see the video. And I said, what video? And she said, you know what video? <laughs> so I got my phone out and showed her the flight under the Eiffel Tower. And of course, when a male is asked a question like that from a young, uh, pretty woman, he kind of puffs up. Okay. <laughs> so I can puff up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then she said, oh, you were so handsome. And I, I, I kind of deflated. Oh, because you were. Were, as in past. Oh, tense. no. Oh, 
Iowa. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> broke my heart. <laughs> well, we can assure you, you're very handsome and we love your hair. And um, as you can tell, Bob is sort of half crazy. He's one of our favorite guests. This is going to be an incredible interview. We are going to head into so much stuff. You haven't been here since September. And everything has changed. At that point in time, we were talking about the election coming up. And of course, you know how popular President Trump was and um, compared to uh, Biden and so on and so forth. But you know what? I want to start off, Bob, with something very interesting, and that's the United States fiscal budget. I want to talk about the numbers because in 2020, just last year, the entire fiscal budget was under $5 trillion for the entire year, which sounds like a lot of money. The specific number was four point um, eight two nine. But so far this year, and we've just entered May, the Biden administration has already spent over $10 trillion. Now, this is from a man who um, apparently is invisible and doing nothing. So, um, We've seen him maybe three times give three different speeches. We've seen a lot of uh, falling up steps and embarrassment and things like that. But how you already spend $10 trillion and no one is speaking about it. But I want you to go into this with us because you've been predicting a stock market crash. You have been predicting financial mayhem. And we've watched the stock market actually get um, new highs, and yet this is going on behind the scenes. So talk to us. Uh, okay. To understand a number like $10 trillion, which doesn't mean anything to me, doesn't mean anything to you, doesn't mean anything to your listeners, uh, you've got to put it in context. And to put the the increase in the money supply and the spending by the government into context, the best way to do it is to compare it to Germany in 1922, just before or just as they went into hyperinflation. Uh, I, I would have never believed it's possible. I mean, nobody got it. Yeah, I, I've never heard people say, you know, I've got an idea. Why don't we go spend two or three or five or 10 trillion? Nobody's ever advocated that. They just did it. And, and they keep turning around. And they keep having new excuses for spending money. Now, I, I believe that we are on the, the top of the stock market. Some of the things that we're seeing are historical as well as hysterical. I, I mean, the, the rise in doggy coin, which was started as a joke, which is a joke, which hit $89 billion yesterday. Okay, uh, you know, when you've got jokes that are worth $89 billion and you've got a president who goes out and literally starts burning bales of $100 bills, you've got problems coming. Uh, I not only believe that we're going to have inflation, we have inflation now. Uh, certainly, stock market is, is a sign of inflation, but uh, doggy coin, uh, photographs selling for $69 million, uh, we're, we're actually going into hyperinflation. The price of lumber is up almost 400%. And it's just the start. We're short of food. There are food crises all over the world. There's riots in Colombia now. There were riots in Paris last weekend. We're in for some really bad times coming up. If, if people are not prepared now they better get prepared. Wow. I want to switch into the Great Reset with you. I'm very, ah! Yeah. I'm very interested about your thoughts on um, actually what this is, what's happening, when it started, and when you think it's going to take place. Because I have a theory on this. So I want to hear okay. first what you're 
diet. Yeah, I, I would be very interested in hearing what you have to say. Let's talk about the Great Reset. The World Economic Forum, headed by uh, Klaus uh, Schwab, uh, I got his name right, Schwab, Schwab. Uh, has written a book. He's talked about the Great Reset. And essentially, by 2030, you would owe nothing, but you would own nothing. And of course, that is the definition of what? If you owe nothing, but you own nothing. It's communism. It's communism. Or, it's communism. No, it's not even communism. Communism says uh, it's worse. Uh, to each according to his needs, from each according to his abilities. Okay. Communism is the theory that we can all suffer equally. <laughs> right. But if you own nothing and you owe nothing, you are a slave. And it, it's bizarre to me that we have gone so far over the edge that people actually buy the book and pay attention to it. And it's actually been in the work for a number of years. There's a lot of stuff that's going on right now that's very scary, including the whole COVID scam where someone was talking, a French advisor to the French president in 2011 said, we need to have a good pandemic and kill off a bunch of people. We need to kill off the, the stupid and the old and the unfit. And when you read what he, he recommended, you go, holy cow, this guy is calling for a mass extermination event. And, and I'll be candid. Everything that we've been told about COVID has been a lie. Everything. We have taken a bad flu, okay? It, it's not serious. It never was serious. It was our reaction to it that was serious. The lockdown has killed more people than the flu has. What we have done to children, I mean, they're talking about giving uh, – the, the, the gene therapy to children who are at no risk whatsoever for the flu. I mean, the, the chance of a child dying is something like one or two out of every 100,000. Uh, the chance of them getting run over going out to their tricycle is far higher. It is gene therapy. Now, let me give you something that's a little bit scary. It does not modify DNA it modifies RNA. And when they've tested these RNA before, when they took them to animal trials with cats and with ferrets, it, it stopped whatever the, the uh, flu or whatever the virus was. However, at the second exposure or a variation of the, bat, of the virus, all the cats died and all the ferrets died. What is happening in uh, India is very scary, and it could be that we're killing off the people. Now, that, that's a truly scary. Not only do we not know um, the ramifications of taking one, there's two and there's three and there's yearly and there's buildup and this stuff has mercury in it and has all kinds of, no one actually even knows what's in this. And this is all over a flu that, you know, affects 0.03% of the population, something to that effect. And, and this is what I don't understand, Bob. Has society been so brainwashed and why is it that you see what i see and many of the other people that i know see very clearly what's happening very clearly and and are are afraid and trying to sound the alarms of where we're being headed into but why is it that the mass population are actually terrified you know if you don't wear your mask you're you want an answer people. you want an answer yes i do fluoride 
fluoride. Fluoride. Talk to us about this. Okay. Where do you find fluoride in your house? Well, if you drink from the tap, water. That's true. Where else? Toothpaste. Toothpaste. Um, Bingo. Okay. Who uses toothpaste? <laughs> Hopefully everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and strangely enough, it, you almost cannot go into an American drugstore, food store, and find a toothpaste that doesn't have fluoride. Now, if you look at fluoride, fluoride absolutely is a poison, and it makes people stupid. There is no scientific evidence that says fluoride prevents cavities. It does not prevent cavities. Americans have been dumbed down to the point, okay, if, if I said name the state in the United States that has the most advantage derived from technology, what, what state would you pick? Wow. I would, I, I, my natural answer would be California, but. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. California just passed a bill saying they are going to eliminate advanced mathematic courses in schools because mathematics is racial. So we do not want some children being treated as if they're smarter than others. We want all children to be equally ignorant. Now, I, I went to school at California in seventh grade, and I was taking an advanced algebra courses from one of the best teachers that I've ever seen. But that was like 60 years ago, okay? California used to have the best education system in the United States. And now they're saying, we do not want to treat children differently because some children are smarter than others. Oh my God. We want all our children to be equally ignorant. I just went, you gotta be shitting me. Are you kidding me? The people that are in charge the lawmakers who are overseeing this, who've changed the educational system, so nobody even knows what the Bolshevik Revolution. <laughs> Mark Faber came on the show, Dr. Mark Faber, about four weeks ago, and uh, mentioned the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, and that we're, we're setting up. And I said something like, you know, well, it started with the mass media, you know, they changed the ideals of the people and they revolted, yada, da. Um, and um, I got so many commentaries from wonderful, intelligent people that, Michelle, what is the Bolshevik Revolution? Oh, and I was uh, like, don't, don't get me started. They, they, guys, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, guys go out to college campuses, okay, and say, what state is New York City located in? Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> let, me, let me think. You know, uh, who fought in the, the Grant's Civil tomb War? joke? I mean, this is this is who's in Grant's tomb, right? <laughs> who's the, the the basic level of knowledge in Americans has decreased to the point where our children are ignorant. Now, I just posted a piece a couple of days ago talking about 10 things that high schools used to teach that they no longer teach. I went through high school at Fort Worth, Texas, and because I had all the credits that I needed to to graduate, but we didn't, we didn't have people graduate in the winter. Everybody had to graduate in June. So I, I had to attend school, but I, I didn't need courses. And I thought, you know, what would be a handy course for me to have? And I thought, you know, maybe I'll be a rich, famous, handsome author one day. 
maybe it would be nice to type. <laughs> so I took a typing course and we had 30 typewriters. Now, I, I need you to tell me as a woman, what was the ratio of females to males in the class? Oh, I would guess that it'd be like one to 99 almost. No, it would be one to 29. Okay, one to 29. Okay, maybe the class was bigger than <laughs> now, What I didn't realize was that there was a far greater reason for me to take that course <laughs> than learning how to type. I mean, my God, how would you like to be a 17-year-old kid surrounded by 29 women? Yep. I mean, one of them in there would have to be a little bit interested. <laughs> But uh, actually, I, I went to the University of Texas. I went to Southern Methodist. I went to Columbia. I went to Iona College. And the most valuable course that I ever took was typing. Oh, and they, yes. don't, they don't teach it in school anymore. They don't teach shop in school anymore. They don't teach home economics in school anymore. When I went through flight training uh, in, in Pensacola in 1965, we were taught how to figure out interest rates. We were taught how to read a bus schedule. We were taught how to speed read. We were taught how to balance a checkbook. And those are all valuable skills that yeah. schools could be teaching. Now they teach you white privilege. Yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. Okay? It's crazy. And, you know, to respect trans and, and the big, the big, uh, debate about should uh, trans boys be able to go into the girls' bathroom. It's just so, you know, and, and that's social justice. And well, that's we, not social justice. That has nothing to do with anything that has yeah. to do with education. As a parent, if you had a 15-year-old daughter, do you want male-equipped males in the same restroom, and it's, my answer would be, hell no. Just so scary and absurd and just, you know, even, even Caitlyn Jenner came out. I respect anyone that wants to live their life any way they want to, and I will defend it. I will defend anyone that wants to do that. But she but he out. wasn't 12 years old when he decided to change. Okay? I'm sorry? He wasn't 12 years old when he decided to change. Yeah, right. This was an adult we, decision. We have a secretary of health who says we need to be chemically altering girls and boys when they're 10 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old. And I'm thinking we don't let them use drugs. Yeah. We don't put them in the military. We don't let them smoke cigarettes. We don't let them have guns. Why on earth would you go to a six-year-old and say, are you a boy or a girl? This and is, if a girl says, I'm a boy, you know, you, you chemically alter them. I That's think it's insane. child abuse. I really do. Um, it's, it's just, you can't put that on a child, number one. And number two, they should be thinking about, you know, Barbies and Kens and what they want to wear tomorrow to, you know, somebody's having a birthday party and, kids stuff you know healthy kids stuff and how safe they are at their home at night this whole thing that pulls the safety out of an entire life of a child in my opinion to start you know talking to them about do they want to trans into another well they they cannot possibly mm. understand it no. at that age and you don't expect them to uh we, we are at peak insanity and the only thing that i think that it's good is it couldn't possibly get any crazier it <laughs> has say that. To get more <laughs> sane from here when doggy coin is 89 billion dollars you're at the top it has everything to do with people's mentality and nothing to do with rationale it's all emotional and nothing's rational and if right. you lose rational rationality, you know, you, you go nuts. But my point, I wanted to just make this point that Caitlyn Jenner came out and she was asked, I don't know where she was in shopping mall or something like that, but uh, somebody ran after her and uh, said, should, uh, what, what do you think of the, uh, 
the new law where boys can play in girls' sports if they identify as being a girl. And she put her dog in her truck and she turned around and she said straight on a very rational answer. We're talking about fairness. No biological male should play in a woman's sport with biological females because it's not fair. Because a biological male who's born as a biological man, you know, male is different than a biological female in terms of strength, you know, speed, whatever, just because of their nature. And um, the reporter, they cut it off, but the reporter's like, well, what do you think about the emotion of, doesn't that, you know, just wreck the emotion of the trans boy who thinks of himself as a girl? What about him? You know, it's just like, hmm, man. Well, uh, unfortunately, and I think the internet has done it, has said that you're supposed to be happy all the time and nothing that's supposed to hurt your feelings. <laughs> and I got some what real feelings. <laughs> okay. Life sucks and then you die. And, and the idea that, that you can't have your feelings hurt, uh, I, I'm absolutely shocked. And I, I'm pleased to hear Caitlyn Jenner say that because yeah. that's absolutely correct. She was very For strong. The whole reason we do not have female quarterbacks. Right. Because a, they're not qualified. Okay. There isn't any possible way. And we've got, when I, when I was in the military, of course, it, it was, it was 99% white, but it was a hundred percent male. Okay. And every airline pilot in the world was male. Now I was 135 pounds soaking wet. There wasn't anything that I could do in an airplane that a woman couldn't do equally or better than me. And I'm glad to see that we've moved from women being secretary and telephone operators to being 757 captains because they're equally yeah. qualified. Yeah, and ability. Right, right, right. However, they're female, okay? And there is a difference between males and females. And one of the things that I've written about extensively is war. To put it in simple terms, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is true. In theory, how many children could you have? One a year, in theory. <laughs> Never. Okay. <laughs> Would want in that. Theory, in theory. In theory, how many children could I have? Uh, zero. No, no. What do you mean, zero? Well... Uh, oh, 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 could you produce? Oh, well, a lot, uh, you know, a thousand a year, however many, how many times? Yeah. Genghis Khan Infinite. has genes in 8% of the population in Asia. Genghis Khan was a very friendly conqueror. <laughs> he was active. Yeah. But there is a genetic limit on how many children a woman can have, and there is no generic limit on how many children a man could have. Now, I, I'm a, I, I am a friend who raised llamas, okay? And I ask a lot of stupid questions because I don't know anything about llamas. I've never <laughs> raised llamas. I don't know anything about farming. I said, look, I mean, obviously... The female mothers of the Kriya have a relationship with, with their child, but do the males give a shit? Right, right. <laughs> she said, uh, actually, not at all. They don't even care. Yeah, you have to okay. say, you know, right, is Genghis Khan, because there's no way that he uh, emotionally connected to all of his children. There is a significant difference between mm males and females for a reason. Generally, men start wars because they think it's exciting and fun. Hey, I got a great idea. I'll go kill somebody who's never done anything to me. Hmm. And uh, leaders say, you know, go kill this guy. And we think how manly. Wars start because of men and they end because of women. Because women get tired of having their kids shipped home 
in cheap aluminum cans, okay? Women feel differently about their children than men do, period. We, how we've gone so far off course and how this whole feelings thing has become so important, people, I, I don't want anything to offend me. Therefore, you have to change your beliefs and change your behavior. Well, my problem with political correctness is it really offends me. <laughs> I'm offended that you want me to be politically correct. Yeah, <laughs> it hurts my feelings. <laughs> we, we've gone overboard with the political correctness, and there it's going to be a backlash. Um, I want to go back to precious metals before we go. This has been an extraordinary conversation. I love truth. Like I say, this is the politics of truth. This is being honest and being straight. And, and again, I'm just as sensitive as anyone else. I mean, probably more so. But you've got to look at the reality of the situation. Um, astrologically, I'm going to just toss this in because it's weird and I think it's interesting. Um, we're moving in, you know, that song, The Age of Aquarius. Right. And sure. uh, yeah, right. we're moving out of the age of Pisces, you know, because, you know, as, as we move through the solar system, we actually move in retrograde. So, you know, if anybody right. is into a, astrology, Pisces, Aries would come next in a, um a regular motion, but we move in retrograde, we're moving backwards into Aquarius. So it's very interesting. I've heard a lot of people that are um, what they call conspiracy theorists. One of them, um, Max Spears, he was killed, but um, he said um, they don't have a lot of time to do this. And I was like, they don't have a lot of time. What? The interviewer cut him off right then and went into some other subject. But anyway, I was like, they, who's they? And, and what do you mean they don't have a lot of time? I think I know what he was talking about, Bob. Um, people are waking up, naturally waking up just because of the energetic physics of the world. And let me, let me, let me take you in a different direction. Okay. Well, and I, I, I think that I've got something you'll find interesting. Were you aware that having money makes you smart? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Okay. I look forward to that yeah. time. Yes. You're absolutely correct. Now, having money doesn't make you smart. Now, how do, how do I know that that's important? I went through high school in Fort Worth, Texas, and there had been a lot of oil found in East Texas around Tyler in the 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s. And enormous fortunes were made. And guys who were drillers or foremans all of a sudden were rich. And I went to a high school in Fort Worth where all of the elite money from East Texas were going to school. So the, there were a lot of kids that I was with who had brand new Corvettes and brand new T-Birds when they were 15 to 16 years old. As soon as they could drive, they had a brand new car. And every single one of them was convinced I'm smarter than you because my family has money. Now, let's take it a step further. When you've got somebody like Jeff Bezos or whether you've got somebody like Bill Gates, they think they're smarter because they have money. But do you realize the extent to which much of their fortune is nothing but an accident? Bill oh, Gates and Steve Jobs happened to be at exactly the right time in the right place to start a, a computer revolution. Now, let me ask an interesting question. Give me an honest answer. If Bill Gates never been born and Steve Jobs had never been born, would someone else have done exactly the same thing? Ask that a different way. If they'd never been okay, poor. Would there be an Apple computer and a Microsoft? Oh, yeah. I of course. So. Somebody would have invented it yeah. because we needed something like that. So these guys have got all this money and they think, damn, 
you know, I'm sitting on $100 billion. I'm the smartest motherfucker in the world. What I really need to do, because money doesn't mean anything anymore, I need to rule the world. Okay, so I'll start making up rules. I'll start doing things. I mean, I think about Zuckerberg and Facebook having the audacity to censor the president of the United States. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I think all of those guys are jerks. I think they're all sociopaths. I think every politician I've ever met was a total blithering idiot who should have been drowned at birth. (laughs) However, we've got these politicians, okay? So some publicly traded company that it's a quasi-utility has decided they have the right to censor the president of the United States. That's insane. It is insane. And what's even worse is that half of our country cheered them on not just cheered. we have we have this is sort of the age of bullies yeah and so their interpretation was oh someone's being bullied oh it's the president and it, it's somehow you know it's like that same we love to you know we love to lift them up so we can tear them down i'm back Okay. You know that saying, we love to lift them up so we can tear them down. That's, I think, has to do with, you know, like actors or, or, you know, anyone, sports stars, something like that. Donald Trump was, um, everybody loved him. Hollywood loved him, you know, everybody loved him. And then when he went into politics, um, it was almost like he got the power that other people don't have. And so now it's like, oh, you know, watch him fall. He, th- he thinks he's this, he thinks he's so great. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's yeah, a- there, there is a German word for that that means enjoying the pain of others. It's not exactly being a sadist, but it is, uh, if you see someone trip and fall, it, it pleases you because they've been taken down. Yeah, there is absolutely something to it. You know, I mean, we have these virtue signalers. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, politically correct. And politically correct. And there's another thing to this. There's another thing to this. It's a very interesting point. We are in this has got to be the era of just like I said before instability. There is a very little concern about reality, about authenticity right now um, in comparison to how something appears perception. Um, People who you know, put fake pictures of themselves up and say, this is me or people who authenticity is, um, and then people actually see what they look like. You know, it's, it's that era of like fake or they'll fake, you know, they Photoshop photographs, like a person who you never see on video, but you always see pictures of them, you know, and there are a lot of people like that, you know, and I'm not going to call out anybody, but you know, Kardashians, (laughs) you very rarely (laughs) The actual yeah. video you're, of them. You're you're going back to value, okay? And it's all connected to money. And I don't know that anybody has ever made that connection. And I'm not going to know for five or ten years if I'm correct. We're going to go back to a gold standard. It's very simply, we have no possible choice. We're going to go back to a gold standard. Let's talk about that. The gold yeah. standard. Yeah. When do you see that coming and what's that going to do to precious metals and our money? Uh, Pretty damn quick. They, uh, what happens when you blow up a balloon? Oh, it pops. I know that the the bust. What if it's a really big balloon? Well, depending on how much you blow it up, it could be a really big pop. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. Big balloon, small balloon, medium balloon. 
if you keep blowing into balloon, it's going to pop. This is going to pop. There is no possible choice. The government, the governments are run by people who are too lazy to work and too nervous to steal. And the beauty is that these guys from Schwab to, to Bill Gates to, to uh, all of the rest of the rich fools out there, they're going to fail. We know they're going to fail because they have failed every time in the past in history. Having money means you have money. It does not mean you have sense. Okay. The problem is it affects all of us, though, Bob. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily affect you because if you got any sense, you'll prepare yourself. That's I've spent twenty years preparing. How my exactly do we prepare ourselves? Is that with precious metals? Yeah, of course. Okay. Just what would you sure. rather own, doggy coin or some gold? Oh, do you approve of do of Doge coin? Doggy coin? Do you approve of open owning it? It's a scam. I know it's a scam, but when it hits ten dollars and you sell, I I, I I obviously don't feel we should anyone should hold. Nobody it. sells on time. Right. Everybody That's waits true. until it's too late. The cryptocurrencies are going to evaporate. They are not going to decline. The government's going to come in and say, look, this is getting too stupid. We need to cut it. OK, uh, quite bluntly, the the warning uh, is already written on the walls when the IRS is demanding to know the names and addresses of everybody. It's traded over twenty thousand dollars in a calendar year. You're not going to hide anything uh, because of the nature of trading cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, a guy could have traded currencies in and out and in and out and in and out and made $50,000 and have a quarter million dollar or half million dollar tax liability. Uh, the government is going to get its pound of flesh, period. And people think it's free ride. Uh, the cryptocurrencies are electronic beanie babies. There is no value there. It is a scam, and it's going to blow up. Let's talk precious metals. Talk to me about prices for silver and gold. I know you love gold, but I'd like to hear your silver. Well, I, I, I've been calling for gold to go higher. As of right now, it's up $27.30. Uh I think that the metals will go up into mid-year. I think this is the year of the massive crash in the stock market. Uh, I, I think if there's a top, it'll be in August and September. We will duplicate what happened in 1929. And I think in October, there will be a crash that will be heard around the universe. When this bubble bursts, Everybody on, in the universe is going to hear it. And it's going to burst. I mean, there's no question about that. I know I'm right there. What about prices? Where do you think gold and silver are going to be? Well, <laughs> could you have predicted the price of doggy coin? <laughs> I no, think but I knew gold, it would rise. Okay. I, I was in gold and silver in 1979 and 1980. And between the end of November... In 1979 and uh, January, I think, 21st or January 22nd of 1980, in six weeks, uh, silver went from $5 to $50 an ounce, and gold went from about $250 to $775 an ounce. That is nothing compared to what's going to happen this time. When the young generation see silver and gold go up and, and uh, cryptocurrencies collapse, there's going to be a run like you've never dreamed of. Oh, wow. What do you think of the timing of Basel 3? Because Basel 3, that which um, basically for anyone who isn't familiar with it, it's a new banking regulation that halts the um, trading of paper gold and silver 
in the banks, in the banking system. And that's a monumental industry, the trading of paper, gold and silver. So that sort of changes everything, right? Well, um, uh, here's, here's what it changes. Base three means that if you've got $10 million in gold sitting in your vault, you can use that $10 million as a reserve, where before you couldn't do that. Uh, what it does, it monetizes silver and gold. Beautiful. And do you think that's got any correlation with the Great Reset? The, the Great Reset is a LSD trip. Oh, okay. <laughs> It'll never happen. There will be a revolution and uh, Schwab's head is going to be on a pike before 2030. Really? Well, you know, all of those things are based on people being stupid. And while on an individual basis, I recognize people are stupid, uh, on a mass basis, actually, there's a lot of intelligent people who have looked into it. And quite bluntly, they may be the only survivors because all those stupid people took. You know, I, th I think you... Uh... I think you hit the nail on a very scary, very important point. What are the benefits out of taking the gene therapy? And quite bluntly, I don't see any benefits. And if it doesn't do anything for you, why would you risk death or serious illness? I have maintained right from the beginning, and I am more convinced of this every day, it is the greatest medical change in history and the most dangerous. And it easily could be a deliberate uh, bio, bio weapon designed to exterminate much of humanity. Could be the greatest mass killing event in history. And it could do it fairly quickly. Between now and 2030, we could oh, really see. Six months to a year. I, oh, I think wow. we're seeing it. I, I think what we're seeing in India is is the <clears throat> sorry i i think very soon people are going to realize hey wait a minute so if, why do i have to eat outdoors why do i have to wear a diaper if i took you know there's no no benefit to it so uh i i think we've reached peach stupidity which means you know maybe we all get smarter because the dumb people die off Something's got to happen because this is just the whole thing is, is stupid. So our best uh, way to do it is um, prepare yourself with precious metals, get as much as you can of gold and silver and expect something big, at least before the end of the year, probably in October. Um, that, that would be accurate. I think by September, October, it will be clear what is going to happen. Okay, right now, er, er, nobody really knows what's going to happen. But I, I think gold going up 29 bucks today. This is something I've been forecasting. Nobody particularly believed it, but I, I think it's here. You think we're headed into it? Okay. Bob? Before you go, I want to cover the junior miners. Um, I know that you are an expert in this sector. Um, among your many great books, you wrote a novel that's called What Became of the Crow, which is very interesting. It has to do with, it's sort of an expose upon the inside of junior miners. You name names. Um, some of them are the biggest names that are in the industry today. Talk to us about the industry, how it's going right now, and about your book. Okay, well, it's not a novel, okay? It's nonfiction. And when I wrote it, I, I really didn't know what, where I was going to go or what I was going to end up with. I just started typing, and, and it, it went. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a accurate, true story of what happens behind the scenes. I've been part of Novo, believe it or not, going back to 1976, 
I took an airplane to the second richest guy in Australia named Lang Hancock. And he made his fortune in the Pilbara iron fields. Okay, he found it in 1952. And then I met Quentin in 2008, and he talked to me about how the gold got into the Wits Water Ramp. He said it's very simple. It's like banded iron formations. Oxygen came up through salt water, changed the chemistry of the water, and iron precipitated out. Well, gold did exactly the same thing. He said people recognize that it's true with banded iron formations, and they don't yet accept that it's true of gold. But why wouldn't it be true of gold? And then I realized, wait a minute. If, if banded iron formations are created when oxygen goes through salt water, changes chemistry, and gold does the same thing, wouldn't it be true that if you've got a big iron formation, you also have to have a big gold formation near there? And, and actually, that's, that's as simple as what the book is, because it becomes obvious the Pilbara's own 29% of the world's supply of iron, in banded iron formation where the iron precipitated out of salt water. Quentin comes up with this theory and explains why the Witz water ran, it, it had so much gold. And he looked around and there were about a hundred basins in the world of the same age as the Witz water ran. And he picked the biggest, which was the Pilbara. But I got to be part of that story right from the beginning. And there's some real charlatans in this business. I mean, <laughs> I, there were a lot of people who were really pissed off at me. And I'll say, and I actually say in the book that it's the mostly true story. I didn't tell a real story, okay? If I told a real story, I'd have people coming after me with guns. Oh, well, but, I mean, it's already kind of an expose. <laughs> Anybody who's into mining or wants to get into mining of gold and silver and finding it, this is an incredible book. and. Quentin is huge now, but it, it takes him all the way. So back in the seventies, that's crazy. Yeah. So you yeah. know him? Wow! I mean, no, no, I, I didn't. I didn't know him then. Okay, I didn't meet him until uh, two thousand and eight. Mm. But I became aware of the Pilbara as being a giant or, uh, iron field in nineteen seventy six. Wow. So, when I, when I found out the gold could precipitate out the same way as iron did, I said, holy cow, okay, this is really a big deal. And I, I think it is a big deal. Novo is in production now. It, it's a truly exciting story. And if anybody wants to invest it in resource stocks, it's the only book that I know of that even comes close to telling the truth about what really goes on. It's a great book. You're so funny. I mean, you've written a lot of books, and I know you're known as being that this is a book everybody really needs to read. Hold it up. Hold it up for us. I know you have it right there, don't you? Yeah. Right. What Became of the Crow? The Inside, inside the Greatest Gold Discovery in History, right? This yeah. is written by Mr. Robert Moriarty, and uh, it's on Amazon. Um this is really another place to be besides physical gold and silver. If you pick the right junior miner, there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of protection to be had right now when everything else is burning down. Wouldn't you say? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Novo being one of them. Bob, this is always amazing to have you on the show. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go? I, I don't think so. We are in for an interesting six months ahead of us. And uh, it, it's just a really good time to have some gold and silver sitting in your hand. Six months, really? Yeah. How sure are you on that timeline? Because it's just so uh, definitive and short. The interesting thing is that I do a lot of things through Kentucky windage. You know what Kentucky windage is? No. 
Okay, I, I grew up in Texas where every kid had access to guns and going out and shooting clay pigeons or bottles or birds was something everybody did. And when you do serious shooting, you use Kentucky windage. You stick your finger in your mouth and you put it up to see where the wind's coming from. I, I can't justify how I can be so accurate, but I've made a lot of very accurate calls and it's, it's just through simple observation. And I've believed for really two months that we've seen the bottom in gold and silver. Uh, Bob Hoy, who I think is one of the smartest forecasters out there, has uh, said that he thinks that uh, the crash will get serious in late summer and happen in October. And that just happens to fit my Kentucky windage. That, that would be a good time for a crash. But that also means there's a real good chance of, of uh, resource stocks doing the same thing they did that they did last March. By the end of the summer, if you've had a lot of profits, you should take some money off the table and sit in your bunker for a month or two. What's your prediction for after this happens? Uh, gold and silver are going to go a hell of a lot higher. The stock market's going to go a hell of a lot lower. And doggy coin is going to be at zero. Okay. <laughs> Take your profits with Dodge coin, doggy coin, dog coin, doggy coin, doggy coin, the dog. Bob, it's always amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Give everybody your website before you go and talk about it just a little bit. Um, three to one gold and three to one energy. And what we try to do is be sort of the Wall Street Journal of resources. I write four or five or six articles a month. We get the very best authors that we could find to write for us. I put in uh, half a dozen links off the website, but we think it, what I'm trying to do is not think for people. I'm trying to help them learn how to think for themselves. My books are not Bibles that says, do this and do this and do this and do this and you'll get rich. It's here's what you need to know to, to invest successfully. And that's based on 50 years of my investing. And I, I'll be real blunt. People are going to be reading those books 50 years from now. Those are damn good books. <laughs> they are. They're hilarious books. I, I, I think the very best thing that I do is modesty. I'm, I'm really good at being modest. <laughs> You're a really good writer, a really good pilot, and a really good investor. Bob, thank you so much for coming okay, on the show today. Thank you, my dear. It's always good to hear from you. Okay, we will talk soon. Mr. Robert Moriarty, precious metals analyst, expert financial commentator, and the founder of 321gold.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com. 